This is Valdemar Nuschak, art critic, producer and presenter, and you're watching Perspective, part of the Little Dot Studios network. Art has the undeniable power to change minds, to enlighten and reveal the unexpected. When future generations look at the art of the 20th and 21st centuries, what will they make of it? And the society that created it? In other words, what will they make of us? Thousands of years after they were created, the great works of art still have influential power. In this episode, we will explore the artistic footprints of civilization that we see right in front of us today. Winston Churchill once said, history is written by the victors. That sounds predictably one-sided. But the art that civilizations have left behind tells us a great deal about the ancient worlds of the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. The concept of art as something that has to do with creativity, inspiration, personal expression, and so on, which is more or less all the concepts that we generally associate with the term art nowadays. Art is ultimately and fundamentally expression of everything that is humanity aspires to be, that humanity regrets being. Art is humanity's memory of the past and its aspiration and desire for the future. The first art, in parentheses, dates back 26 to 30,000 years ago and is found in cave drawings in southwestern France and in northwestern Spain, such places as Lascaux and Neo. In those places, the drawers, who are master drawers, drew figures of rampant animals, for example, but they also, secondly, drew, put their hands on the walls and drew around their hands. They are saying to themselves and to others, here is the world we live in. I don't think you can find one overarching theme, and I think it's probably more useful to think in terms of visual culture than art as such because art implies a certain type of value, whereas really they're using visual images for different reasons. These objects, artifacts, uh, that we very often use and refer to as art, uh, had normally very different functions in the pre-modern times, not exclusively aesthetic ones, but functions such as social, political, religious, and so on. In many cases where, especially where there is no written sources, uh, that were left from particular periods, those artifacts are sometimes exclusively available to us for understanding habits uh, and civilization of the ancients. When we look at the great civilizations of the ancient Mediterranean world, what do we see? What speaks to us? Nothing spans the centuries in quite the same way as the art of ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, and others. Can we not catch a glimpse of ourselves in these relics from the distant past? These footprints of civilization still give pleasure today. Where does the artistic impulse begin? Perhaps at its core, it is simply the desire to express, I was here, I existed. The Chauvet cave paintings in southern France, the artists who made them around 30,000 years ago 
came from the fine drafts people. The paintings display a terrific sense of movement. Early on, they start with visual images of one particular part of themselves, which is what we call hand stencils, which is the idea of putting your hand up against the wall, and then they would spit paint onto it so you get an outline of the hand. What is extraordinary about this is that it has a, a very wide geographical basis to it. You find it in Indonesia, in South America, in Africa. You find all over the idea of copying your handprint in this way. And some people have wondered, is this really the start of human consciousness, of this idea that I am a person and I am here? and this is me. Some claim that they had some magical function, so that they were meant as a way of reassuring themselves that, for example, they, when they go hunting, that the hunt will be successful, or that maybe these drawings also had healing purposes, and so on and so forth. Uh, whatever the reason was, those initial drawings were also can be perceived as a form of communication. It's often said that the early animal depictions are to do with hunting, but actually archaeological evidence doesn't entirely bear that out. When we come to examine the diet of early human beings, we find that those were not actually the animals that they were eating. It may not be they were hunting them, it may be they had another significance for them. And they look at animals and see some very good qualities that animals may have that maybe we don't have uh, today. They can see animals as being brave, animals as being fierce. So this tells us that man always created the representation, uh, the art, to speak to him. And that's why people in antiquity, and maybe modern people too, speak to statues, for example pray to statues. They're not asking that matter speak to them, but they're asking that that concept speak to them. And so art is the continuation and the further development of our communication systems. Tens of thousands of years after the first caveman began drawing on wall, human beings still leave their mark whenever they can. The tools and instruments may have changed, but the impulse and the concept remains the same. Let's go back in history more than 5,000 years when the ancient Egyptians were painting and carving some of the most incredible works of art the world has ever seen. An unmistakable style. The bust of Nefertiti. She ruled ancient Egypt, mostly as a co-regent, but was for a time its sole ruler. She was at the center of an enormous change in Egyptian religion and politics. This is one of the most iconic pieces of art to survive from ancient Egypt. Her face is practically symmetrical, flawless. What for most people stands out in specifically Egyptian art, sculpture, or other visual imagery, drawing, is that it's very static. And some suggest that this is precisely to evoke a sense of the divine. Perhaps it is a foreshadowing of an idea that the divine is not merely beyond the physical, but that there is some sort of incarnation in the human of the divine. We certainly have some very idealized features, but we also have some that are clearly not idealized. I think they chose the image they wanted for a specific purpose, and the purpose was to give a representation of the person, of the most important aspect of the person. Did Nefertiti really look so beautiful? Was she so flawless? Probably, possibly not. But 
maybe that's how she appeared to them. The idealization as a method of de depiction is not something that was meant necessarily just to give a stylized representation of a concrete human being, but also something that was meant to depict a principle, which is something that appears in the form of a concrete human being, but it also represents something that is much more apersonal or something that surpasses concrete individual appearance. Pharaohs and queens of Egypt guarded their images carefully. How about women in power today? Unlike men in power, women still feel a pressure to display and maintain a public face. Their images are retouched and perfected in Photoshop in order to match contemporary perceptions of beauty. Nefertiti's bust was created by the court sculptor Tutmosa. It is believed she actually posed for this bust as the artist's model in his studio. We know very, very little about the sculptors or any of the artists who made the Egyptian art that we see today. And this is the only example that we have of an actual artist studio. But we don't know if he was famous in his own day, in his own town. These uh, architects or sculptors or painters were not treated uh, in a special way in the ancient Egypt or some other ancient civilizations because they have some talents or because they have something to express in the same sense in which we expect that from artists nowadays. The reason why they had special position was more similar to the special position of scientists. Uh, they have special position and they are paid well because they produce something that within our society or in the ancient uh, Egyptian society was special, was treated as something that uh, an ordinary person cannot do. Nefertiti, like other pharaohs and queens, was instrumental in the creation of ambitious building and arts projects. Consider the Sphinx at Giza, the pyramids in the Valley of the Kings. All of these were commissioned by Egyptian royalty. Old textbooks used to have this idea of the pharaohs as bringing in loads of slaves and kind of whipping them into doing this. But we now don't really believe that that was so. We believe that probably people gave their time, that they considered it to be part almost of their tax. They may even have felt that there was some honor attached to building this pyramid or building these monumental temples. And so they are doing it at times when they're not at home farming. They go and give their time, give their expertise. And that's quite interesting. Why would people do that? And it comes down really to the figure of the leader. Of course, if you were an Egyptian pharaoh, such as Khufu, builder of the Great Pyramid at Giza, money really was no object. The laborers who did the heavy lifting were paid in food and beer. But those same laborers also believed that helping to build the pyramids guaranteed them a place in the afterlife. In Egyptian art, the importance of religion cannot be overstated. The connection between their religion and art never changed. The greatest pieces of art from the Renaissance were also inspired by faith. Pieces created by Michelangelo, Donatello, and Leonardo da Vinci.
Indeed, with over 2,000 identified deities, the Egyptians had a god or goddess for everything. While there was one supreme deity, Ra the sun god, there were gods for mummification, wine and beer, childbirth, war, and many, many more. There were the hawk-headed gods, Horus and Ra. There was Sobek with his crocodile head. As you can see, the Egyptians really let their imaginations run wild. There's a significant amount of anthropomorphizing, that is rendering human or partially human, because humans look to the more noble elements, virtues, qualities that these things possess, the strength, the power of a lion, for example. They were expressing the unity of nature, that man had a particular role which he shared other species, a broader species, uh, in life. Uh, part of it is dependent food supply or animals which are utilitarian. Others of it are emotional. For example, they presented uh, cats. There are cats everywhere in Egyptian art. We could say that's emotional, possibly. The footprints of civilization reveal themselves in unexpected ways. There's something strangely familiar about the half-human, half-beast Egyptian deities with supernatural abilities. Hollywood has, to a certain extent, subverted that by making that bestiality into something heroic and perhaps implying that we might have that inside ourselves as well. Maybe we also have the ability to be super strong or climb buildings, but instead of using those qualities in a bestial way, which is what has worried philosophers up till now, perhaps we can use them in a superhero way. But the art of ancient Egypt surprises us in many ways. Realism started to emerge in the art of the later period of ancient Egypt. This is the so-called Boston Green Head. It's not a work by Marcel Duchamp or Louise Bourgeois. This sculptured head of an Egyptian priest is from the 4th century BCE, the so-called late period of ancient Egypt. These days, it resides in a reinforced glass case in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, a long way from where it was created. Despite being around 2,400 years old, it looks like it could have been sculpted in the last 100 years. We're so used to stylized and formal portraits of Egyptians, yet this is a portrait of a man, not of a god. He has wrinkles on his face and what looks to be a wart on one cheek, and he is definitely overweight. We can see that they were depictions of some individual personalities, but at the same time help us quickly associate them with Egyptian art and Egyptian culture. So in a certain sense, both heads show us how an artist or sculptor in this particular period can approach his or her subject from the point of view of making a realistic depiction but importing at the same time certain principles of stylization. We'll double back to those civilizations around the Mediterranean that rose up after Egypt's decline. But now we jump forward in time to see how influential the art of antiquity has been to the present. The modern-day Renaissance man or woman, or to be inclusive, Renaissance person, they are cultured, sophisticated, and have polysyllabic titles after their name, like writer, musician, artist, for example. Viggo Mortensen is a perfect example. He's not only a celebrated actor, he also paints, writes poetry, and fluently speaks Danish, French, Spanish, and English. And in so many ways, the actual Renaissance of the 14th to 17th centuries was about the discovery of ancient works of art. If we're thinking about what constitutes a Renaissance person, if we think about 
the origin of the term. The great thing about the Renaissance was that people spanned the arts and the sciences. So people could be an artist and an architect and examine nature. They could write and paint. And there is something about that broad span of knowledge, which I think brings knowledge in itself in seeing connections. As we've gone on through time, we've tended to specialise a lot. The Apollo of Belvedere. After centuries of neglect, it was found in the 15th century and today resides in the Vatican. It was most likely carved by Leo Caris, the favourite sculptor of Alexander the Great. It was one of the most admired Greek sculptures during the Renaissance. It was immediately recognised upon its discovery in the late 1400s in Rome as a long lost perfect example of the classical ideals, symmetry, balance, perfection, both physically in sculpture as well as in symbolism, in interpretation, the classical ideal of beauty, the aesthetic principle, and particularly perhaps the human ideal, what it means to be the perfect human. The Riachi bronzes, also Greek, discovered in the 1970s by an amateur scuba diver off the Calabrian coast. And finally, La Ocoon and his sons. It depicts a priest of Apollo and his two sons in their death throes as they are slain by serpents. Has there ever been a greater artistic study of human suffering? La Ocoon is an interesting character in Greek mythology. He was a Trojan priest. He was a priest who was very suspicious of the wooden horse and he tried to persuade the Trojans not to bring the wooden horse into Troy. And this angered the gods because, of course, they had determined that the Greeks would win the Trojan War. So it was said he was going against the will of the gods. And in order to punish him for that, a sea serpent was sent to drag him into the sea and kill him. But what is tragic about the story is that it's not just him, it's his two young sons. The ancient Greek sculptors were truly great craftsmen and artists. Yet somehow, in later centuries, so much of their artistry and technique would be forgotten. Just compare the realism of these artworks with the art of the Middle Ages in the centuries before the Renaissance. Medieval art has a power and a certain charm of its own. But since ancient times, the draftsmanship, sense of proportion, and incredible technique have all seemed to have denigrated through the centuries. Why the great leap backwards? Rather than looking at these styles as progression of one style and its decline, we nowadays prefer to think of them as separate styles that should be judged on their own terms. So instead of comparing particular aspects from the ancient Greek or Roman style that they were using and then saying how good or bad medieval art is compared to these standards, of course, in ancient Greece, much of the artwork depicted the gods. In contrast with Egypt, the Greek gods, reduced from thousands to a mere baker's dozen, were only depicted in human forms. And they all lived on Mount Olympus, except Hades of the underworld, who was the 13th. Though Greek gods were immortal and had superhuman powers, they weren't necessarily great role models. 
The Greek gods were anything but well-behaved. They were one big unhappy family, constantly squabbling and having ill-advised sex. They could be childish, vindictive, and petty. Probably the most impetuous and infantile of all the gods would be the chief head of the gods in the Greek pantheon, namely Zeus, exhibiting probably the least virtuous traits that any human being could possess, that of jealousy, that of rage, that of allowing those kinds of passions to do harm to others. Similar in nature to the Greek gods, many of today's celebrities and their culture are notable for their tantrums, bad habits, and messy personal lives. Too many are famous for being famous and not for legitimate achievements. Art has always conferred prestige on its big money patrons. The art world of today is really big business. People with very deep pockets pay incredible sums for works by artists who, at the time of creating that art, might have struggled just to feed themselves. It is believed that Van Gogh was only able to sell one of his paintings while he lived. And yet, a century after he painted it, Van Gogh's portrait of Dr. Gachet sold for $82 million. What about the artists of the ancient world? Were they mere servants or glorified tradespeople? Did any of them get to be rich while they lived? This is the Aphrodite of Nidos, a sculpture by the Greek artist Praxiteles. One of the things that Praxiteles was particularly admired for in his depiction of Aphrodite was the flesh, because female flesh is very soft, and so to make the, the statue convincing of being a fully sexualized woman, you would have to render that soft flesh. And that's very, very difficult to do in marble. Male flesh, for example, in a marble statue, you can make a male statue look muscular and hard by polishing. But to make such a hard substance look convincing as female flesh is very much more difficult. Artists like Praxiteles, who were freed from the expected obedience to an emperor or state, were able to express themselves with impunity. Sometimes that meant breaking with the official line in order to make a statement. It didn't matter if their work made people uncomfortable or not. The Athenians were rich enough to sponsor great works of art and architecture. What rich means in the ancient world is not exactly what it means today because we live in a money economy and they did not. They probably received the high honors of the community. In the Greek world, these people were honored very highly for their uh, techne, their art, but not as art. What they were doing is giving figuration and life to Greek beliefs. This was very superior kind of workmanship, but that they did not consider it as quite as we did as art. The Parthenon in Athens, part of the Acropolis complex, a temple to the goddess Athena, built after the Athenian victory in the Persian Wars. The statue of Athena has long since disappeared from the Parthenon. It was removed by the Romans, who probably melted it down. But a replica of Athena is housed thousands of miles away in Nashville, Tennessee. The footprints of civilization show up in all kinds of places. It is, as you can see, very colorful, with ruby red lips and sky blue eyes. She's robed, carrying a richly decorated shield and spear, and she wears a gold helmet. What's going on here? Is it artistic license taken to an extreme? The answer might surprise you. One of the great shocks, I think, to a contemporary audience is the idea that these wonderful white marble statues and the temples were, in fact, painted. In 2018, a traveling exhibition called Gods in Color 
polychromy in the ancient world created equal parts excitement and disbelief. Here were some of the most famous sculptures of antiquity in glorious color. We are so used to seeing the sculptures of the ancient world in cool white marble. That's been the accepted view since the Renaissance when these works were rediscovered. But it turns out that after centuries of exposure to the elements, the vast majority of the statues and sculptures lost their original paint. The artists of the time copied what they saw, leaving their stone sculptures unpainted. Just think of Michelangelo's statue of David, for instance, white marble perfection. For many people, actually, it would be very shocking to see these sculptures the way ancient Greeks or Romans would see them in an everyday context. So, so they would be kind of ancient Greek or Roman versions of photoshopped images. They would actually use their paintings and their sculpture to produce images that would be visually appealing, including those details that for many people would seem very strange, sometimes you can see them also in museums. People are shocked and I very often hear that also from my students that they call it kitsch. But if there was one ancient civilization above all that would be best seen in glorious technicolor, it was ancient Rome. From the earliest days of Hollywood, there was always something cinematic about the epic grandeur of Rome. Of course, day-to-day -day life would have been a lot less colorful for the average citizen. Some of our viewers may remember this cultural moment. Do you remember when pop music lovers had to make a choice between the Rolling Stones or the Beatles? You couldn't really be a fan of both. Art historians can be similarly polarized when it comes to the art of ancient Greece and Rome. Greek art and sculpture have been revered for centuries and considered an early pinnacle of human artistic achievement. Roman art, on the other hand, is often seen as a pale imitation. Though it's always been acknowledged that the Romans were exceptional builders. But then, art is part design, part craft, and sometimes part technology, as is the case with these mighty works of architecture. This is the Pantheon in Rome. It was built to the design of Apollodorus of Damascus. And it's as magnificent as Brunelleschi's dome in Florence, built well over 1,000 years later during the Renaissance. The footprints of civilization have always reached for the sky. It's something that really impresses us. But I don't think in itself statistics make a building influential. If the building doesn't work as a building, we're not going to just be impressed by people telling us the width and the height, etc. It's got to actually impact our senses. And that's where the Pantheon really comes into its own. Because every time you go into the Pantheon, it's like you're going into it for the first time. It's different. It's different at every hour of the day. It's different with the weather. It's different with the month of the year. It's different with the light. It's an extraordinary building. The Pantheon, Greek word meaning to all the gods, a temple dedicated to all the gods, was in fact never intended in its current form in the early second century to be dedicated to all the gods. Rather, the Pantheon, constructed under the Roman Emperor Hadrian in the early second century was intentionally designed to be dedicated to one god, that god being the god of the sun. Because at the time, Rome was already moving towards monotheism. Why? Because monotheism, borrowed from ancient Egypt in Rome, justified the consolidation of complete power into the hands of one, namely the emperor. In terms of its engineering and architecture, a perfectly symmetrical 360 degree sphere or circle. Again, symbol of the divine in itself. It's also, interestingly enough, so well built, it still has the widest dome in the world. 
that's never been exceeded. Although in height, there have been many other domes that have been exceed that are much higher. The dome is so well constructed that it has never cracked in a city that's had major earthquakes. But the Pantheon has never come down. The dome has never cracked. It, it has multiple engineering architectural features that are, are still unique today. To create a dome that size at any time in history without internal supports is an extraordinary achievement. So all these building techniques, it's a uh, design, the proportions, the very careful mathematical calculations that enabled this architecture uh, were very something that, that fascinated uh, people throughout the ages. The influence cast by the Dome of the Pantheon can be seen across the planet, from Santa Sofia in Istanbul and throughout the Islamic world. Its influence is seen in modern America and the iconic architectural world wonder, the Taj Mahal. The grandeur of Rome is well known, but the mighty temples, parliaments, and public spaces tell only one side of the story. What about art on a smaller scale? The art that well-to-do merchants might have used to decorate their homes. Were the Romans house proud? Did the wealthy see their homes as reflections and extensions of their good taste and place in society? Today's strata of those leading the lifestyle of the rich and famous have multi-million dollar homes and no end to their pride. There was a time when famous rock and R&B musicians were considered part of the counterculture. Now, however, they're proud to show off their homes and possessions for the cameras. The Romans reveled in luxury and conspicuous consumption they would likely have loved lifestyle television show. These are wall paintings in the house of Lucretius Fronto of Pompeii. They depict morality tales and episodes from Roman mythology. This was, of course, a wealthy man's villa, which was attached to land. It was a far reach from the everyday Roman citizen. Probably it was very important for people like him to demonstrate to the world that he too had a good education. Romans wanted everybody to understand position in society and their level of education. And so they decorated their houses with stories from the myths, in stories from the Trojan War, in historical references and references to gods and goddesses. One of the things that we realize is that even quite poor people or people quite far down the social ladder could afford to have their houses painted. It was not just for the elite. It was a very visual society, in fact, very visual, very polychrome, highly colored. We will probably never know precisely what all of these wall panels mean, but it's reasonable to assume that this residence would have been considered, at the time, highly stylish. And of course, some of the best preserved Roman art was literally underfoot. The footprints of civilization were laid down in mosaics. 
These cubes of stone, ceramic, and glass were arranged precisely to form vivid, colorful, and intricate designs. Mosaics were more than decoration, for they told stories often packed with drama and violence. No emperor reflects drama and violence quite like the Roman Emperor Augustus, depicted in this statue. With or without color, it's everything that we expect of a Roman emperor, strong, relatively youthful, and all-conquering. There's a message here, and not a particularly subtle one. The Romans, of course, were masters of what is referred to today as the dark arts, propaganda. This particular image of Augustus was spread throughout the Roman Empire, unchanged for the 40 or so years of his reign as emperor. Octavian came to power at a very crucial moment in Roman history. There had been a republic. The republic was failing. There was violence on the streets and there was a civil war. Ultimately, the person who gains power after that is Octavian, who then becomes Augustus. Absent on Augustus are wrinkles around his eyes, a receding hairline, love handles, or stooped shoulders. He would always be depicted in top shape and form. By the time he dies, he's in his late 70s, nearly 80, but the image is still that image from before, because the important thing is that everybody understood the image, because the image is the image of restoring the Republic, whatever the reality was about how the government was run. So it's not personal vanity, it's all political with him. Everything with him was political. Augustus was undoubtedly a hard man, who took power in the wake of the assassination of Julius Caesar, but there's nothing to suggest he was insane. Some of his successors were a different story. The Roman Emperor Nero was obsessed with art. He was also just plain obsessed. Nero was well-versed in poetry and music, painting and sculpture. He sang and played the lyre. So it might even be argued that Nero was indeed the first true Renaissance emperor. It's difficult to speculate on Nero's personal talent as a performer in the dramatic arts. One, because most of what we have in the written record is negative propaganda against Nero. Secondly, however, what we can see of what remains of Nero's legacy is still visible in different areas, especially in the city of Rome and its surrounding areas, his famous Domus Aurea. And if that is itself any testimony and testament to Nero's talent, if you will, as an artist, maybe not so much a dramatic performing artist, but certainly an artist with a mind for architecture, with a mind for the aesthetic ideal. Though he was a most cultured man, Nero was also a bloodthirsty madman who had both his mother and his wife murdered. He was famous for his many acts of sickness and depravity. It may be best to remember the cultivated aristocrats of Rome who had an eye for the finer things in life. But many of them would have also regularly attended the amphitheater to watch men battle each other to death or be fed to wild animals. The difference between being cultured and or cultivated and civilized is perhaps being civilized is what any citizen of a civilization is expected to do, how they're expected to behave. And the idea of being civilized is top down. Being cultured, being cultivated, it comes from something within that the human person may struggle with, but nevertheless aspires to something loftier, to something beyond one's own limitations as a human. I think we would all like to think that you can educate people in to behaving well, but history shows us that isn't true. Some of the worst, most bloodthirsty dictators have loved art and collected it, have often patronized the arts. 
it didn't mean anything. Unfortunately, these things don't go together. And in fact, often I'm told that one will find that people who've made a lot of money out of criminal enterprises love to put their money into art. There's no doubt that the Roman Empire was capable of great tyranny and cruelty. It's also true that they left behind a treasure trove of incredible architecture, dazzling wall paintings, and stunning mosaics. For that, they deserve our unwavering appreciation. To this day, treasures from the ancient societies around the Mediterranean are still being unearthed. Happily, they're more accessible to us than ever. The roots of all that we have today are somehow buried in the antiquity somewhere. The Greeks and Romans created these forms of art and their content and their sensibilities and aesthetics for us. If you've never experienced visiting the pyramids, the Parthenon, or Pompeii, you can go online to take a virtual tour of any of them. In that sense, you can easily experience the ancient world as never before. We understand art as a very complex set of human activities that come out of some creative urge. So trying to eliminate art from human history seems to me to be the same as trying to imagine human history without human beings. Anyone with an eye for today's beauty, drama, color, and lines can appreciate how the footprints of civilization show up in their everyday lives. And what are we without art? Art is the expression of, of all sorts of things, most especially leaving our, if you will, footprint for those who come after us to see that someone else has already been here has already done that. It teaches us to be self-reflective. It makes us think about ourselves. And it opens up our creativity. It affects us emotionally. It makes us respond. And we have to listen to that in order to get the most out of it.